Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. That's the start. What's going on, Josh? Like that's the start? That's the... That- that's- that hit record. That's record. It's got a clapper on it. Well, that syncs up the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easier in post production to gotcha. be able to link up the sound the sound Do the audio. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. So that's what that's for. But Josh Elderton, welcome back to the podcast. Absolutely. Buddy. I always enjoy it, man. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. Uh we got to spend all day together out in the woods running around and and, and I'd planned on podcasting with you last November when I was down here hunting, and it didn't line up. I was down here for a short period of time. You were busy as all hell, so it just didn't didn't work out. Yeah. November, you were down here. We were busy. Yeah. Everybody was hunting. Yeah. All of us were. Yep. I don't... Could, had I already killed a deer? You had already killed a deer at that point. But I was helping. Yeah, you were helping, and I think you were hunting with Brody... And That's right. That, I think that was what was going on. And then on. you you weren't down here four days? Yeah. 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 That, that was it. Yeah. So I didn't didn't have the rut trip that I had originally planned. Um and got sick and it was just kind of a kind of a mess. And I really we'll change that this fall. I've got a chip on my shoulder about West Virginia right now and it's uh Well you need a little enough. redemption in West Virginia. I do. From two years ago. I know. That that was the best hunt experience i've had for whitetails in a week but also the most like salty when i was leaving the fact that i should have had one deer on the ground for sure and another one that real close (laughs) real close real close that's the but that's the ups and downs of ground hunting and you failed them that week because that was a you hit that was in 21 Yeah. yeah in 21 you hit like the week because we were in deer the whole time weren't we yeah it was i mean the weather was good yeah it was cold kind of crappy out you know it was just like you know some a little bit of rain mixed in some freezing rain and just and then even on the sunny days it was still cold and it just uh it was a great great week for it and you got to experience seeing a bunch of deer chasing the highs of being so close and then the highs of the one deer coming in you got to watch him come from a distance yeah and then you got the lows of not getting him thanks for reminding me well <laughs> it it doesn't even bother me to talk about the highs and lows because i've had so many highs and so many lows ground hunting that like i'm used to it yeah of getting busted or missing and people don't see all that, but it it's not all success. Yeah. And and like I definitely learned and I knew going in that it was gonna be a struggle. Like and I had, you know, one of the best teachers in yourself to be there and help <laughs> gu- guide that. guide me through it. And but it was what's what's really cool, I, I just did a podcast with my cousin Mason there a little while ago and you know, we were talking about you know, mule deer hunting and like how he likes mule deer hunting because you can see, you know, you can see deer moving, you feel like you're in the game. And this is like a mixture of you're hunting mountain whitetails in some of the steepest, most rugged country down in Southern West Virginia that, that I've ever seen and hunted. But you can also have a little bit of that Western vibe with spot and stalking and some of the reclaimed strips. So like, it's just it's like like nothing else that I think you can find. And I I can't make that comparison because I've never been out west. Mm-hmm. But I've had you, Zach from you know THP and uh, a bunch of others say, "Man, you have to go out and mule deer hunt or elk hunt. It's right in your, you know, right up your right up my alley." Yeah. No, I I I would totally agree with that. But I had. And, and the listeners that have been listening for a while have known, like, I've, like, fallen in love with hunting down here from that one trip. I mean, it went from you inviting me down to joining a lease with you and yep. being able to 
go and go. Yeah, and just go and, and try to, to figure it out, um, you know, by putting cameras out myself and doing some of those things. And, and I'm still learning a lot. And today was amazing because we got to go out together and I got to, you and I have hunted together, but I've never scouted really with you. Well, we've never been able to go. When we've been together before, we've always been going. But today we got the BS, we got the chat. I got to ask you what you were thinking. Yep. You know, because I'm always, I was telling you earlier that I'm always listening to you guys and seeing if I can put that information here to help me. And then I got to chat with you on what I was thinking. And yeah. We've never been able to do, we've never done that. No. I mean, because even when we're hunting, you're being quiet. So you're not yeah. like having full on conversations like, like we were able to today. And I thought that was really cool. Like to get to see and 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 you and i were hunting some similar spots like we were hunting similar deer just in like a little bit different locations and we've been sharing intel back and forth and helping each other and it was to see like how you were looking at setting up or like how you look at hunting something was so interesting to me because this is this is a you know i've hunted mountains and big woods and stuff but Every area has its own intricacies, and here is so different because it's not. There's not a ton of different elevation levels. There's a giant jump from the bottom to the top, but it's straight up and straight down for the most part. We were so, both looking at the slope angle, yeah, for our area, and it's like right on the brink of being vertical. Yeah, for like everything. Yeah, for everything around here. Yeah, um, and we we had a couple of the same deer. We were couple few hundred yards apart but we had a couple of the same deer this past fall yeah that we you would get when i wasn't getting through the area that i had cameras in and then there you had cameras in but you were just up on top and i was the next elevation down yeah the deer was running the same place which and when you say like the next elevation down for anybody that's listening or watching, you think about if you're in Pennsylvania or you're another spot or even Ohio and Hill Country, the next bench down is normally 40, I don't know, 80 yards down over the hill, um, somewhere in that range. Down here is like a good 400 yards. I mean, like. Yeah, the next the next bench down, I mean, probably we saw it today, um, probably 200 vertical feet. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess it would be that. And. The, and if it's a 200 vertical feet and it's sitting on a one and a half to one slope, you're going, you're looking at 300, 350 yards. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's insane. And, and so yeah, you were, and I've learned a lot about your strategy with being that one bench down and finding some of those flat spots that are very hard to find. That's that very hard to find in those places that you're actually able to hunt because we walked some near vertical side hills today and misery and it was yeah miserable and there wasn't much deer sign and it's not that deer maybe maybe they'll go through there maybe they don't i don't know but like once you found those places where you could find some of those trails and everything hit on like some sort of a flat spot it just seems very a lot more huntable i mean like i was telling you out there today <clears throat> they're just like us i mean they're going to try to find the easiest route on them unless something's chasing or pursuing them. I mean, I think those deer will, will run up those side hills, but are they traveling those side hills? It was obvious today. Yeah, no. There was zero sign on the side hills when we were just trying to get from point A to point B when we hit the side hill. Yeah. Um, and I just think that the deer are going to follow that least resistant path. Yeah. No. And, 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 uh, like, so, so just to, to try to paint a little bit of a picture here, you know, these ridges are just big, long ridges that have just points that jet off in different directions. And, you know, and, and when I'm hunting in Pennsylvania and New York and Ohio and these places, there's a lot of these benches and side hills that enable to hunt, but here that you're just not getting besides old prospect roads or logging roads, They'll travel those on the side hills, but other than that, they're not on that that steep side hill. They're working the points running right. down off of them. And you showed me your 
I mean, it was worth just the whole day of you showing like what you look at on these points for like these little flat spots that kind of roll off yeah. and as they go. And that was that was super interesting to me. I've always hunted points, like I was telling you when we were talking about the wind and thermals. I've always wanted to get out on a point just so the wind, if as long as the wind was correct, and it was a, you know, I never wanted up, up and down wind. Doesn't matter if it's east or west or north or south. I didn't want it, the wind to be running up and down the point. And I never thought about thermals for long, the longest time hunting. I just wanted a crosswind from the point so that it would blow my scent out in the holler either way. So I always hunted points or I'd hunt the head of a holler uh, or the head of, for the listeners, a drainage system. Yeah. Um, and that's where I always hunted, or I'd be on top of a ridge, hoping my wind would blow again off in the atmosphere either way it was going. I never wanted to blow with the ridge. Yep. I always wanted that crosswind. Yeah, and, and that, I mean, that makes sense from being down here and seeing, like, those are probably the most bulletproof wind setups, like, that, yes. you, can, that you can hunt as you can. You're still going to get the, the swirling and the different things that happen, but... That is definitely, you know, from me learning it is just like that, that makes a whole lot of sense. And, you know, we were talking, I think our conversation about thermals that we had, and you, you can see it over on the, uh, Josh did a video showing the setup on the Untamed's, uh, Instagram page, but where, you know, we were talking about thermals and I, and I think, you know, even myself should do a better job explaining this, but it's not. I mean, this is just our opinion from what we're seeing, but like thermals don't always just go straight up and straight down when they're going. Like when straight up, straight down the slope. The slope, correct. So, and and for anybody that's watching, it's going to be a little bit better to be able to see. But essentially, if you have like you have a drainage that goes up, a draw, and you got some points coming off the sides, and you got like a bowl almost kind of in the center there. It's just think if you were on the top of the ridge and you dumped a bucket of water, how it's going to flow down. And it eventually goes down to that center draw or drainage and then goes down. But the, so it, it's not always like a straight vertical up and down the slope with that those thermals as they are kind of just pulling towards that center piece. And the closer you get to that piece, the stronger yeah. that you're going to have. And that's why when we were talking... If there would be, when we were on that, when we finally hit that little flat and we were like, hey, it's a pretty prominent trail here. There's some travel. And I told you that it didn't matter to me if there was rubs and scrapes all along there that I would never hunt that side hill. I'd never hang below or above it because I know that I'd, I'd fail because it'd be so tough with the wind swirling on the side hill. And I think that your thermals, and we agreed after we spoke about it, that the thermals in that area would be traveling at an angle. Yep. And with the wind and the angles of the thermals, it's probably why there's so much sign there is because they're pretty well protected. Yeah. Um, I'd hunt on, I'd find one end or the other to try to find a place to hunt and we and we did yeah, we did on the one end find a pretty hot place and a, a really natural funnel for that area coming off of uh soft you know i don't know how you all the, the explain that transition between it's that, kind of a that hard vegetation edge. yeah that hard edge yeah from a soft you know browse edge to timber edge but we found that when we found that there was some really prominent trails right there coming in and out. Yeah. And, and I found that that particular spot. So I was looking on uh, the web map of Spartan Forge and I could just see like the old tram roads or, or prospect roads or whatever you want to call them that were going around. And it met where the reclaimed strip portion of it is so that you have a bunch of autumn olive bushes and just a bunch of other green briar grasses that type of browse and food uh, or cover and then you hit the hardwoods of the oaks and all of the other different hardwood trees that you have there so you got two different types that met at that one particular location and from that location 
you would you would look and there was also the train met perfectly there so there was a little bit of a bench and you had the draw that was coming up that was so steep it was almost like a cliff like deer were just not going to travel across no they're not and so but it met all at that point and when we got there we were just like yes this is the spot like this is where you should hunt and so i i will be coming out with a a youtube video i'm actually going to say this so then it makes me go through and edit it and, and actually do it and actually do it um so i'm going to be doing a, a video where we have the um uh we're basically the whole day scouting showing kind of what we're talking about here and showing the setups but you know josh was talking about his your the tree setups and explain a little bit like when you have a place you're at the head of a hauler or a draw or drainage whatever you want to call it how you kind of have two different setups well i think about whether I'm decide if it's going to be a morning stand or an evening stand, but if it's going to be uh, both, like the ground's so steep, so it's not. Um, you can be in a tree here, and on the front side, you can be looking at the hillside in a flat, and on the downside, it'd be sixty foot. So when I think about that in that short distance where we did find that choke point in the funnel we looked at a couple of different trees and i think that the the trees that we found that we both agreed on but then my first initial thought was these pawpaw trees because they're, they're always real limmy and they're really shitty trees to get in but they got really good cover and um so in the mornings, especially right there, because I really feel like it being that steep, that in the mornings that the thermals would come up. But when we saw the trails, there was a trail probably 15 foot difference in elevation from where the trails, was. there was multiple trails. And I don't know how to explain it to the listeners, but I feel like the thermals would, if you wanted to hunt there all day, I think you could out of those pawpaw trees. Because it's so steep that I think the thermals would pull over top of that yeah. flat. So even if they were pulling up a hill out of that drainage. Yep. And then in the evening, they're obviously, unless the wind's overtaking them, they're definitely going to pull down that holler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's not going to be a question about it, that your thermals are going to go down that drain because it's damn near vertical. So I think that that's a safe bet on that side. But on the other side of the two trees we looked at, it's the same concept that nothing's going to be traveling above you in the mornings for your thermals to go up the hill. And you're going to be high enough in the evenings that I don't think that the distance, the horizontal distance with the vertical distance, I don't think that your thermals will ever hit in the area that you plan on killing a deer in. Yeah. Or where the deer are coming from, because they're going to come from, you know, you're, if you're at 12 o'clock, they're going to be coming from your four and five. So I don't think that they'll ever hit where it's so so steep in such a short horizontal distance. Yeah, no, I... If I, that I, makes sense to the listeners. Yeah, and, and so, like, and, and just to add a little bit to that, like, so that spot where that is is relatively flat, and then everything else is so steep, so... Basically meaning that, like, the thermals and everything will pull over top of them. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, and and, and I would agree. And, and who knows? We could be wrong. We could go in there and find out differently. But, you know, again, use these assumptions based on things that you've seen and kind of what you look at, and then you try it. And if it doesn't work and all of a sudden you're in there and it's like this isn't doing what it should drop some milkweed and it drops right into the trails where they're coming, well, then you're going to have to move, you know. Yeah, you tear down. Yep. And – Move to wherever it works. Yeah. I mean, you have to. If if I think that there's so many hunters that get in tree stands, get in saddles, they're in blinds, and they're out there and they check the wind, and, oh, man, it's bad wind. I'm going to go ahead and sit here, though, because I'm here. I'm telling you right now that it will pay off even if you have time it pay off to move or leave. That's my opinion. I mean, I don't know. How, I can't count how many times that 
I've jumped 30 yards and went up another tree or been on the ground. And if I'm hunting the ground, just a ground set, not being mobile, just move. Yeah. To get the wind right. Because I don't care if you're a scent freak or not. I just don't think you're going to beat a deer's nose if the wind is not in your favor you're i just think you're screwed and and honestly even if you're a scent freak you can't get to that spot without sweating yeah (laughs) you got to get there one way or the other yeah it's it's not an easy place to access and no but i i think that's all i think that's all really really good information and i think like i know for myself I always used to struggle. I always could find good deer sign and find where I think I could kill a buck, but to find that exact tree and find that exact, like that takes an art and that takes a long time of knowledge and experience to, to kind of be able to figure out. So that's what we're trying to help, you know, you guys kind of see how we look at it as far as, I mean, we spent a good 35 and 40 minutes sitting there kind of looking at things, talk, talk about it. Yeah. Oh yeah talking about it figuring it out and i mean there was actually a, a nice scrape that was right there too um some rubs like it, i mean that it, it was just like everything you could want you know that again like what i just said about the other thing i learned from you is it made my trip that one spot could be one of those spots that you know we get one of us kills a deer out of there during the rut like i think you could sit there all day and be in a really good spot oh i think so too i mean just because of the <clears throat> the action coming out of the brows and that the hardwoods and the hardwoods that that transition line there i think it could be hot and then you have the ditch that's running long ways out to where we went afterwards and those deer trails in there and i just think that there could be a lot of action right there yeah and that scrape was a it wasn't like a serving plate scrape i mean that was a pretty large scrape yeah under that autumn olive i mean it was probably four five foot yeah i mean it was a big scrape yeah and those those uh i i said it in a video when i wasn't with you but those autumn olive bushes to me are like and what i would find like they're they're definitely a place that deer like to scrape under and they also like to bet i kind of consider it to mountain laurel a little bit um in some areas like as far as just like they they're big they're they're prominent the deer can see the licking branch for a while i think that's why they like to use them or similar to like beech and hemlock trees in pennsylvania because they keep their leaves long and they're just like a good visual for those deer and it holds scent and they just want to they like to i find i think i found most of my scrapes like today and when i've been here under those types of bushes oh yeah and they're more prevalent here too yeah another reason for it but and there always seems to be autumn olives on that edge. Yeah. And so, and there always seems to be a flat between that that hard edge and the soft edge. And those deer are traveling that, and there's always autumn olives there. And, you know, you always find the small sapling pines that are used for rubbing in this area. But a lot of your scrapes are under those autumn olives. What about, okay, so looking at that setup, um, you know, we talked about it from our rut standpoint. Do you see it any other time of year? Do you think at early season or late season that it could still be good, or would you just, would you be looking somewhere else? No, I think early season you could hunt it. What's your, what's your thought process behind that? Because I think the deer are bedding there in those hardwoods somewhere along. I mean, when we hit, when we hit that flat, when we finally got off the side hill and hit the flat, I mean, I started finding droppings. We found a couple beds. There was a couple beds right there where the setup where that funnel was. I think that the deer are using it naturally, traveling in and out. So I think you you know early season. I think you could probably hunt that funnel probably all season long. Now peak out yeah you'd love to be in there in the rut because it could probably get pretty damn exciting a lot more action but even if 
early season, you know, we set a camera up there. Say you go back in August and there's nothing but does. That's fine. You just don't go back till November because you don't have any bucks. You know, the bucks are going to be growing by then, you know, getting ready to shed their velvet. If you don't have any big bucks on there through the summer and there you don't see the growing process, then you just don't hunt early season there. <clears throat> yeah. But if you got a bunch of does traveling, then – November 8th, 9th might be a time to start laying in there because the, the bucks are going to start checking those does. I was hoping you were going to use that term because I was just about to bring it up. I learned it. I learned a term from John. I learned a lot of terms from you, but the, the term, <laughs> <laughs> the term, <laughs> the term, lay, I say a lot, of, I say a lot of stuff that. <laughs> Only folks around here are going to understand. <laughs> well, laying, when you, I remember you'd tell me, you're like, oh, man, you'd be like, Zach's laying on that deer. He's laying. I'm like, what's that? What does that mean? You just you just mean like just putting time in. Yeah, putting time in. You know, he's just laying on them. I love you that. Know, when you know, when, you, when you're hunting one or hunting, them, you know, hunting deer hard and you find a buck and he's just going to lay on, you, you just got to lay on them. Yeah. And it just... It's no different than laying on your old lady. You know, you get in tight and hang on. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so that's what that's what you do when you're deer hunting. You find a big buck, you better lay on them. Because if you don't lay on them, just like with your old lady, somebody else will if you ain't. <laughs> so that's what it is yeah no that uh <laughs> i love that that's like, fact i just hope you know that i've been using that term you know back home and and i sound everyone start to I'm, catch on i everyone's thinking i'm smart they're like holy cow he's laying in there what's he, what's <laughs> he doing right. I'm, I'm laying in that's there. right <laughs> and a lot of times that's what it takes yeah you know to, to be successful i mean and i i've said that twice to be successful and i had a conversation I was texting back and forth with a buddy of mine, and I don't measure the success off a of kill because, like, today was a success for me, and we didn't do anything but just learn from each other. So I, I'm successful every time I go out just because I love being in the hills. and and But real success for me is killing something. Yeah. You know, yeah, it pays off. No, I – and and honestly, I feel like, you know, some of the knowledge we gained today and walking through there – you know, that's, that's hopefully a future kill yeah. success. <laughs> well, it was just like, um, when we left there and we, and we, we tried to shed, huh? I don't know about Bo. Bo's picked up a few sheds, especially in the last couple of weeks. I by no means am a shed hunter. Don't claim to be. I just like walking around. Like if I stumble upon one, I'll find it. <laughs> but like, I'm not a shed hunter, but when we were, kind of splitting up and walking over to the other point where I had an old camera that had been soaking since September. Once we got down there and the leaves were off, and I think I would went down there maybe a couple times in the fall to change batteries, and we found that that big rub, and it was gutted. And there was high time scratches. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah. I mean, even if that deer rubs all comes up where he was shredding, I mean, those tines are still, they're tall. But when we looked at that place with all the vegetation and the greenery off, and then you and I split and walked down the edges of that point, like, there's a big buck in there. I just didn't catch it on camera because after looking, I don't think my camera was in the wrong place. I sh you said it when we were down. I, I think I should have had multiple cameras in there just kind of looking. Yeah. Um, because there's so many angles and so many trails coming from everywhere that the deer just didn't walk in front of my camera. So I didn't know everything that was going on. But then when we walked 
and saw the trails and the sign that we did. Like, it was like ding, 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 big dummy. You know, I think that's another good area that could that could pay off. Well, yeah, and I think what I think what a lesson to be learned from that is like anytime you go into a newer area or somewhere you haven't been, you know, you, you put out some cameras or you hunt it. It's you're going off your your best guess judgment at that point, maybe on past experiences or whatever. And then as you get there, now you start fine tuning. You know, now you're coming into the second year running, you know, going to run cameras in there and possibly hunt. It's like, okay, I found these rubs. I found these other trails that are there. Like now you're adding more pieces of the puzzle together and you'd found a spot that you think that you would set up just a little bit further down. And now you're just, you know, you're just starting to adjust a little bit. And that's where you start doing that and it starts compounding. And all of a sudden you start to really get to know an area. Yeah, I agree with that. It's just that the, and I've heard all kinds of people talk about cell cameras or, you know, the cellular cameras that send you pictures to your phone, regular cameras, you know, you put a camera out, you either get a picture, you check it or you don't. But like when I was getting pictures, the deer, the deer that I would hunt never walked in front of my camera. So I never went back to the area. I mean, that was it for me. But Maybe if it was over on that point, yeah, I would have seen a big one. It is what it is. Well, it's just going to get bigger for next year. Yeah, it's what we hope. It's what we hope. <laughs> yeah. We did find good sign in there. Yeah, we did. No, that was that was a uh, yeah, that was really good. And, and it's funny because you know coming down here, I had like I had looked at all these areas and all these spots I want to go to, and you you realize once you get into this country that like, you can't cover as much as you want. I mean, we did a little. We did, I think how, we did how how much did we do today? I want to say I have it on my my watch here. I want to say it was a little over uh, about six miles. Yeah, so about that's and, a pretty good day down here. Yeah, uh, and and this kind of country and up and down the elevation and going through the. Everything wants to poke you. Everything wants to grab you. It's just, uh, it's nasty. And that, so to really, you know, for me, like I have another day of scouting in here. Josh is going to be heading back and, um, I, I'm planning on just continuing to break down that area, some more ch- different elevations and covering it and really getting to know it because I start spreading myself too thin and then I'm not really getting any valuable scouting done and I, I i like to get to learn an area the best i can to feel like that i have options too so for example when we're we're scouting you know we're covering different elevation levels we're going through different things and a reason for doing that is you don't know what the mass crop's going to look like it come you know october when s- seasons kind of open up you might have all your acorns if you have any down low and that's going to change everything that we had seen or if you might have everything and it, you know there's just like there's so many options i feel like covering those different elevation levels and those well, things that's are, exactly right i mean if the mass hits early season and through the rut they're always going to be up in the in the semi-open country and up on top and that the old strip area and the coal mining areas the reclaim areas during the rut always because they're cruising up there whether it's off an old Razorback or it's on the main ridge, they're they're always going to be cruising, depending on what the wind's doing. But early season, late season, if there's a mass crop. You know they're going to be in the timber. They're not. They're not. They're not going to come up and eat clover and browse on multi floor when there's acorns down in the holler. It's it's that simple. So that might not work. Of course, where that funnel is is a good transition between timber and the top, but you're going to have to go in the timber to find the deer. Yeah. If there's a mass crop. Yeah. No, that, that, that definitely makes sense. What I, I want to, I want to talk a little bit and shift gears here a little bit about last year. Uh, I want to talk about your hunting season and then ultimately when you had shot a buck that you sent me back in July and said you wanted to shoot this deer and that you did. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, 
Uh, last year we, you know, had some cameras spread out, just trying to get an inventory of what was there, what was growing. And I have, since March last year, I've took on this undertaking of trying to grow these mountain food plots, and it has been a bear trying to clear that, trying to find flat enough land, clear it, good enough soil, and then get to it and plant it, you know, lime it, fertilize it, weed kill it. It's it, like I've had a couple of food plots at the house and I know I'm circling here, but this is how I found the deer. Yeah. Food plots at my house, you've been over there, it's kind of it's there's some terrain but it's rolling. It's rolling terrain. It's so I've I had some successful food plots at the house. I said, well, hell I can do that in Logan. You know, because the deer love it at the house. It has been a, and I'm not by any means giving up, but it is. I give respect to these guys that have these food plots because it's, it's a lot of work. And then you take the terrain we have here; it's so rocky, very little soil. It's it's hard, and I'm getting ready to start back into that food plot season, but. In doing all this and and trying to better the 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 land that that we're hunting, we put some cameras out in strategic locations and um, found a deer. And everybody in twenty one, several people had the deer on camera, and, it was, and they 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 named it the flyer buck. And he was an older deer. And then we compared pictures, 21 to 22, I got a picture of him, and he hadn't grown a whole lot. Just a big, massive, you know, pretty good width. Um, not very long times, long enough. And he had a flyer coming off his right main beam that was six and a half, seven inches. Well, I had pictures of him in July, maybe in August, I'd have to go back and look. Then all of a sudden he just disappears. Like he's gone. Like I have no idea where he went. And then we get into hunting season and, and you know, during hunting season, man, I run around like a rat on acid, you know, just trying to find a deer. And I'm going from one place to the next, trying to glass, trying to find a deer. If I glass one up, whether I can hunt it on the ground, hunt it in a tree. And it's it's really hectic, and it's so different here. Like, it's not a typical place. And you've hunted down. This is going to be your third year down here. It's not a typical place. Like you're going to come for a week and and, and harvest a, a mature whitetail. It's very hard to do that here. Yeah, I would agree. I, I mean, even if it was two weeks, give you better odds, but it'd be very hard to commit two weeks down here and kill mature whitetail. It's even hard for, for, for me and the, and the other locals that are, there's a bunch of great deer hunters around here. I mean, bunch of great deer hunters, but it's hard to continue to annually kill a mature buck. And I didn't even know where that deer went and I didn't have any deer. I mean, I had deer, but we have, you know, we have minimums on the lease and you're trying to find one of those one of those deer, and then Zach said, Zach and I were talking, and it was late October. He was like, "Man, I think you need to go and look for that flyer deer." And I was like, "Dude, I ain't had a picture of him in six weeks, seven weeks." And he was like, "I think you ought to go up there and just look around." And I did. I went up there and looked around. Man, I found a car hood scrape. By God, I'm telling you, it 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 was. I mean, it was tore up like a, I mean, like a can of crowd. I mean, it was all diced up. I was like, this is as hot as it gets. And I hung a camera up right there, and then I went on out the out the ridge and found some other sign, but it wasn't like anything like that area that that I found those two scrapes in and it was a natural funnel 
two high knobs and it was a nice flat going from that soft to hard transition and that night at like 2 30 in the morning i got a picture of him on the scrape i hadn't had a picture in six seven eight weeks and he was working that scrape so the next day i didn't i opted not to go in there early in the morning because i didn't when i hung the camera i didn't even think about picking a tree out because i was like you know who knows what's going to be under because didn't know we knew deer was in there but didn't know what they were so didn't pick a tree so went in the next next afternoon and um hung up in a pawpaw tree it was terrible i mean it, it might have been an eight or ten inch tree and I think that the limb that, that Alex and I got in, I'm, I'm telling you, it wasn't seven inches. Like, I, I thought that I was going to break the top of the tree out when I shot the deer. Like, I got stoked. And I thought that it was going to break out. It was so skinny. But I wasn't 12 foot in a tree. Um, but that deer, most deer activity that I've experienced since, like, 2003 four when i was in ohio never had an evening like that in in west virginia um probably heard 25 snort wheezes and you could tell that they were different deer because they all sounded different and we after we were there and in listening to this happening like a this little 10 point We'd hear him up on the hill in this thicket, and these two knobs in this this funnel, this choke point, these two these two knobs were just just big thickets. So the deer would run in there and start chasing, and you'd hear him snort wheezing, you hear him fighting, and we're like, oh, that's that that's that ten point that was just down here. That's the same snort wheezing. Then then we heard like a, and I was like, hey man, that's different. And he's like, yeah, that sounded way different. And then we heard another one i mean it was it like i've heard snort wheezing but i've never heard it that prevalent just seemed like every two or three minutes you'd snort wheeze and then just just grunting and then i mean it was nuts i'm not i mean i'm not i'm not kidding you like i've i go back and think about it and it's like i said I've I've never experienced it in, in in Southern Four, and when I talk about the Southern Four, Southern Four bow hunting only counties, and this deer, I mean we've had deer running all over us. We didn't do an interview for two hours because all we're doing is action, and a doe comes off the hill and come. She's so dogged out. She comes and runs into an autumn olive 10 yards from me, and she's hunkered in that autumn olive, scared to death. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, that's true. I'm serious. She, she's hiding. She's just wanting to get the hell away from these bucks. Because I think, you know, we probably saw seven or eight does that evening, and maybe two of them were in heat. And this this little one, she's been dogged to death. Every buck up there is like after her, and she she runs down off the one of these knobs, and I'm looking, and she runs ten yards from us, and she's hunkered, hiding. I mean, like she's wanting the hell away from these bucks, and she's in the autumn off, and I hear, and I'm like. Alex, and I was like, that's a different deer. He's like, he said, that didn't sound like a deer. I said, dude. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, come right off out of the thicket, I see him coming. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, then I about lost my shit. I'm like, that's, that's the flyer deer. And I grab my bow. And uh, he comes down like he's looking for her. And I'm telling you, she ain't moved. 
Now, I'm telling you, she was hiding scared. I've not seen a deer do that. And that deer comes down, and there was two does off to my left that had been bumped. But they weren't in heat. And, like, that buck comes down, and he looks at those does, and he, he thought that that was one of those hot does. And he starts walking towards them. Of course, he didn't make it to them because I smoked his lungs, thumped his butt. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't until I shot him and he ran up and crashed. And then that, and I, you know, then I kind of lost lost my stuff, you know. It didn't until when I lost my stuff that that, that doe finally came out of that autumn olive. And, like, she just kind of trotted up that other knob. I mean, she was really trying to get away from it, scared to death. And I just thought, it, like, she stayed tucked in there until she just couldn't stay tucked in there any longer. But, yeah. So that was the that was the first deer I killed, and which was just, I'm telling you, man, it was a sick hunt. Oh, well, yeah, and, and anybody can watch that hunt. You got it over on YouTube yeah. on the Untamed channel, which is I'd highly recommend watching it. And it's it's funny because, like, the video is absolutely full of action, but you can't you can't even like capture all of the stuff that goes on to be able to to be in a video, and that's why like I really wanted to hear it from your mouth because when you told me it on the phone that day or a, a couple of days later, whenever we talked, it was like, yeah, that's insane. Yeah, so so Bo is like on my list to call when something happens. And I call him, and I'm always like, if it's deer season, Bo's like, hey, what's going on? Because <laughs> he, he knows something's happening. Like, <laughs> I'm always like in a frantic state of mind if something happens. And, and, and There's only two th- there's, there's two things that, that happen when Josh calls me during deer season. He either killed a buck or he's, he's in a bad spot mentally and needs picked up. You know? That's right. That's, that's, those that's are the right. two options. We've, done, we've been through that, too. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. But that that day, I mean, I'm telling you, like, you know, that ten point that came up the hill, and and you all should go check the video out on on the Untamed YouTube channel. Uh, a ten point that I passed, that was Pope. He was Pope and Young, but he didn't meet our minimums on the lease, and we had a lot of comments on there, like, "How can you not kill that deer?" And he was like seven yards when he came up chasing that doe and from that point on like i and they were scrub bucks but i've not had that many bucks grunt and snort wheeze and i mean hell the doe that was in heat and like that small eight point was on her like i think she wanted bread because another doe started approaching her and, like, she stood up on her hind legs and give that other doe, like, a left-right. Said, hey, this is my man. And, like, run her off. So, I mean, we saw everything that evening. I mean, it was, it, it was, a, it was unreal uh, vocally and just the scene of it. Yeah. To see everything that, that deer hunting has to offer. Like, I was tore up for probably like 30 hours after that hunt <laughs> about killed Zach getting out of my Jeep. Cause I was just still lost it and cracked two of his ribs. When I speared him, I slipped out of the Jeep and about broke my neck. And I mean, I was, I mean, I was, I, I was like super stoked and it, and it, it was a good deer. Yeah. Beautiful deer. Yeah. Big, heavy rack, heavy mass. And I mean, you get Flyer. that heavy mass down here and it's a little bit wide, thick, chocolate rack i mean they're just like a bow hunter's dream you know not the biggest deer in the world but you know he he met he met our minimums and he was a i was super proud of that deer because where i had him in early season but then lost him but that deer came back so it was a great hunt i mean like talking about it now and giving the story like yeah. like i'm <laughs> i'm not like ready to rip, rip my skin off like I was down in Kentucky, but I was stoked. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that the last comment I want to make on that before we talk about your Kentucky one, but is, again, I refer back to that podcast I did with Mason, and I asked him, I said, how often do you think, because he hunts particular deer a lot, and he's been very successful killing those particular deer, and I go, how often do you think that, 
the deer someone's hunting doesn't always like disappear to like you know miles away and that they're just living under your nose you're not getting them on camera and stuff and and he's like i i think a lot most of the time like i think that those deer are living somewhere that they just might not be in front of your cameras or not they might have changed up their patterns a little bit and it sounds like that deer was probably living somewhere around there he just wasn't doing what he was doing before yeah and it's totally different than um the deer i was chasing in 2020 and i've never hunted a specific deer until that year and, and i've you'll never do showed, it again and i will never ever 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 do it again i won't i'll be an opportunist like i've always been but that deer i was getting two three daytime pictures a day and i was like i'm in his bedroom and this is totally opposite of what mason was saying yeah so i knew i was in his bedroom i was sleeping with him i was laying on him when the deer ended up getting killed by another hunter and then all these hunters that I never even knew were putting pressure on that deer had pictures of that deer. I went back and started looking at the days I was hunting that deer and I thought I was in his bedroom. That deer was nowhere near me. That deer was over at those guys' cameras as long as their, their, their timestamps were right. So the days that I thought I was on him, he was a half mile, three quarter mile away. Jeez. So I what I mean, it was just a waste of time when I thought because I was getting pictures that I was there, and I I really was in his bedroom because I mean the deer got killed two hundred yards from where I was hunting, him, just down the mountain. But the days that I was hunting, and I thought for sure that'd be the day, I wasn't even in the ballpark. Yeah, you know. No, uh, that yeah, that that makes sense. I love I I don't love it because it's bad for you. But I I oh no, I loved I love oh, this good. I love this story though when you first told me about that deer, which was like one of the biggest mainframe eights I think I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean it ended up grossing one seventy four. Yeah, and. And, but talking about it and you learn so much, I mean, every deer has its own personality and they all do their own thing. It's just like, you know, like particular people, you know, if, if I were to be hunting you, Josh, and I knew that it was hunting season, I know a particular gas station that I could go sit at and, and snipe me every morning. Yeah. And get you in a, you know, and if I didn't get you on your way into the, the feeding area, I know I could get you coming out. Yeah. You know, yeah. I might, I might, you know, not be able to get a clean shot as you're going in, but you're going to go in, you're going to get your coffee, you're going to get your bacon and eggs. You might get a couple water bottles and then you're going to come out. You might have to fill up the Jeep before you head up on the mountain. And, but, you know, someone else. They might have a different gas station that they're, they're going to head to. Maybe they go to a different gas station every every morning. And some days they're going to make coffee at home, and they're going to have that there. And it's just different. So like, that's the you same. know, it's the same thing as as, right. as people. And and I, that's what uh, my buddy Johnny Stewart always said. He's like, you know, he's like, if you went and hunted the McDonald's parking lot, if you're hunting people, he's like, there's certain people. He's like. You you're in them like you're gonna kill them like that's you got that opportunity. He's like, there's other people they don't ever eat at McDonald's. It's just not gonna happen, yeah. you know. And they're that and, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it, it is kind of funny when you think of it that way. And it just and it takes a lot of times you don't learn all those tendencies until the deer opportunity is already gone. But it's just like you you learn so much when you are following a certain deer. And and I think you and I have similar thoughts on this because. Now, this past year I was hunting a specific deer, but I am also I'm I'm an opportunist where I'm gonna shoot other deer. And I think I think like not that I'm saying like that way's right, but that's just for me, I feel the best when I'm doing that. So I don't get like my sights set so high on this deer and the opportunities are so low because I do like shooting deer. I do like having good good hunts. And at this point in my hunting career or whatever you want to call it, I'm just not ready to to go all in on one deer oh no i, I mean 
just like me hunting that flyer buck. If another deer that would have met minimums for me. You need any more? No, no, I'm good. I put me a big crane dip in. <laughs> Add some high west whiskey or just sipping on Yeah. That. It's actually really good. It is good. Um But if another deer would have come in, I would not have said I'm not shooting you, I'm I'm hunting a flyer deer. Yeah. I'd I'd have collapsed his lungs just as fast. You know, I'm not doing that anymore. That year, like I had a blast hunting that big buck, and I that that some gun taught me a lot. You know, but I won't do it again. And I mean, I say I won't do it again, <laughs> and I probably won't really. It would have to be a really special deer or something with character. That I was just like, yeah, I, I want to kill him. And there's something to be said for those guys that do it. That that have that that discipline and that you know that swag. Yeah. To say I'm hunting this deer and that's it. That ain't me because I'm I'm gonna be honest with you. I like killing stuff too much. Like I have, I mean, like I love. I, I love to eat it, process it, the whole deal. Like I, but like I get so excited and stoked about that because that success for me is like huge. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we eat venison at my house three nights a week. So I get stoked about it. I get stoked when Brody's successful. I mean, he's feeding our family at the age of 13, 14 years old. Yeah, which is awesome. Yeah. I mean, so. I'm just not going to commit to it. I, I commend the guys that do it. Well, I and and I had a comment, so I'd said something similar to that before, um, and I was like, I like hunting deer and I like shooting deer, and same thing. I mean, it fills my freezer. I eat it all the time. I'm always making venison and stuff. I don't really know how to make any other food, so that's just kind of what I cook at my at my house by myself. And when I shot a small buck in New York, which I was stoked on. And I had some comments like, why don't you just shoot does? And I said, and it's like, okay, yeah, you can shoot does. And does need to be shot and managed just like bucks do. But at the same time, there's also that level internally of shooting a buck is, for me, more fun. And, like, I get so much enjoyment out of shooting a buck. And I like the way my dad explains it. So my dad is one of the best hunters I know. And he kills some great deer. And then, you know, every every few years, he'll shoot one that's a good deer. It might not be a great deer, but it's a good deer. And his method of what determines what's going to trip his trigger is if it gets him pumped up. If he's calling it in, it's grunting, it's coming, it does something that, like, and makes him excited. And he's pumped about that moment. And that just, like, you know, Get you. just gets it. I, I don't think it really needs any more explanation than that, you know. I don't have any. I go out and kill does, too. Yeah, exactly. They all eat the same. Yeah, but if you're if you're a whitetail hunter, you're out there to you know. There's different level of hunters. I mean, some hunters just going out and kill, you know, because that's what they want to do. They feel like that's what everybody buys their license. If I want to go out and hunt a, a trophy whitetail, a mature white, not even a trophy, because I don't. I mean. I've never had one deer that I've killed scored unless it was just somebody like you grabbing the rack and go, let me put a tape on it. But I like hunting mature whitetails. They're nothing better than chasing big bucks. They all eat the same. I'm going to eat, eat this buck just like I'm going to eat this doe. We kill does too. So I'm not going to listen to anybody say, well, if you're just eating, why don't you kill doe? Well, I don't like chasing does. I like yeah. chasing big bucks. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's to each their own, man. Quit judging other hunters and just support them. I mean, if I want to go out and kill six does and that's it, hey, man, that's cool. Yeah. Fill your freezer up. As long as you're not wasting them, who cares? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And If it's... you want to be the guy that, that chases a 200 and that's all you want to do, go do your thing. You know what I mean? There's no reason 
because I'm gonna eat them all. <laughs> what what's that shirt that you're gonna get made that your grandpa had in the photo of you of a kid? What did it say? I always think American. Always think American. Always. And that's simple. As Americans, we are free and we have our own choices to be able to make and what makes us happy and that includes shooting deer. Yeah. Those bucks, big bucks, giant bucks, muy grandes, button bucks, scrubs. <laughs> it don't matter. <laughs> do your thing and enjoy it. As long as you're out there enjoying it. Yeah. Do your thing. Man, I love I love that cuz it's like and for me, I I have like different scales depending on where I'm at and what that experience is and what I'm looking for to get out of it. Like I said, that time I was in New York, I literally told when my buddy Michael asked me, one of my best friends from high school, college, everything, we hunt together. He's like, what's your goal in New York when you go up there? I said, <laughs> I said a future 120. <laughs> he, started, he started laughing. I said, I'm, I said, I just want to go up, have fun, hunt on the ground, shoot a deer, I did that. I spot and stalked in the timber, shot a buck. I was so pumped. And then, but like Pennsylvania, I've been hunting there for quite a while, well, my whole life. And like, I have different goals. I want to shoot a four-year-old deer or older. And that's what my goal is. And so that's what I'm trying to do. In West Virginia, one, we have our minimums as far yep. as on the lease. But also I was like, I have a true opportunity to kill a potential giant deer of 150 inches or bigger down here and that's what my that's what i'm that's what i'm shooting for and i'm okay going home without it and not gonna feel upset or sad or whatever you know all it's gonna do is drive me to work harder to do that next but like depending on where i'm at what experience i want at this point in my life is is how i look at things and i think anybody not that i can tell anybody what to do but it's like Anybody should look at it and what their situation and circumstance. Tony Peterson said it best in my podcast before. He was like, you know, Tony's like, I've been hunting my whole life. I've hunt, I've shot a lot of deer. So no one that's, you know, newer to hunting or hasn't killed many deer should have the same goals as I do and expect to to be happy about it. You know what I mean? Like it's it it takes it takes some time and being able to to figure that that time and experience to be able to, to figure that out. And man, it takes some, it takes some, uh, deflating the lungs multiple times to start getting good at doing that. And that's, <clears throat> we were talking about Brody earlier. Yeah. Brody wants to come down here and hunt the Southern four. And he wants, he wants to chase big bucks. He thinks he's ready to chase big bucks. And we were talking about, I want him to come down here and spot and stalk does and learn how to ground hunt. It's the best way to learn how to ground hunt. Squirrel hunting and spotting and stalking does. That's the best way to learn how to ground hunt. And I want him, he's killed one Pope and young deer. He's killed one one buck with his bow. He yeah. killed a Pope and young, and like, he thinks he's almighty Mr. Whitetail. He ain't even a killer yet. He killed that deer. I just want him to get out and enjoy it and just become a deer hunter and and you got to kill stuff and experience stuff in order to be able to capitalize on a mature deer, if that's what you're wanting. And he doesn't understand that because he's still young. But, like, I still will full around spot and stalk does. Yeah. I told you that. that yeah. I said, I'm getting a doe tag for this year. I was too late to get one this past year, but I want to practice spot and stalking and shoot a doe plus the deer need managed for sure Absolutely. um but it's like i want to get that practicing because i i'm not i've killed a total of three deer off the ground and none of them spot and stalking so like i have no pedestal to stand on say that i'm able to do that and i need to put in the work to get to that point and yeah and and be learn how to do that better and and that's that's how you do it and it's funny you talk about brody which it's crazy what you said. How old is he? 14? 14. Which is mind blowing because I can promise you I didn't look like Brody at 14. I didn't either. <laughs> he looks like a man. Yeah. And, uh, he didn't look like me. I'd be worried about the UPS guy. You hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say the milkman, but they don't deliver milk no more around here. So, uh, 
I'd be worried about the about the brown truck guy. Yeah, <laughs> if he didn't look just like me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but when I was twelve, I remember sitting in that double ladder stand with my dad first day of rifle season. My twenty two Hornet that my grandpa gave me. That's what I used for my my first rifle. And Spike walks out on this gas line. I said, Dad, he ain't big enough. He said, You're gonna shoot him. I said, No. Dad, you shoot big bucks. I want to shoot big bucks. He said, you're going to shoot him. I'm like, okay, all right, he's pretty pretty serious about this. I'm going to yeah. have to shoot him. And that's what I shot, and he's like, you got to earn your way to getting there. Now, right. Obviously, if it was a big buck, he wasn't going to tell me not to shoot it. But you have to get those reps in to be able to do that. And I think, I think it's cool. I love watching the way that you're – uh, parenting with Brody on the hunting side and being able to see like, cause he's going to be better for it and being able to have these experiences and build himself up. It's been, you know, three years. Well, since COVID Brody really, when COVID hit from that point on, Brody really latched on to hunting. And, and the thing about it is, is, and I've told you this is when we get in the, in the, the tree if we're deer hunting or if we're out there squirrel hunting whatever we're doing me teaching him he doesn't know it he wouldn't understand it right now but like he has made me recall in my mind and he's taught me as much as i feel like i've taught him just in the questions and watching his mistakes and me having to guide him He's taught me as much as I've taught him, I feel like, because I take all this stuff for granted because I've been doing it so long. And I've watched him miss deer, miss turkeys, meaning he's he's missed several of both species and really been down. But those are game time reps. It's just like playing baseball, basketball, football, Whatever you do, volleyball, it doesn't matter. There's a difference in practice. I can take Brody out right now, and he will shoot with me archery level par. He might even better me at 20 to 30 yards. I mean, those are practice reps. That is not the same as a deer walking in front of you and you pull them back and kill them. Those are game time reps. Knowing when to grab your bow. Putting that pin on a live animal instead of a target. You have to get the game time reps in order to gain that good experience. To harvest those animals. Whether it's turkey or not. I mean, he missed three turkeys before he killed his first gobbler. But a couple of those was his fault because he... He didn't have game time reps. Yep. You know, he had, he knew he, he, he shot a shotgun. We went out and patterned it, did all the stuff prepping. But for the first season and a half of turkey hunting, he sacrificed and kept on grinding and grinding. And those game time reps, he finally, it started clicking for him. And, he successfully killed his first gobbler. And then he killed a second gobbler. You know? So he's getting... And I, and I think it's... I use Brody as an example, but I think it's with anybody. I mean, you can practice shooting, practice shooting your rifle, practice shooting your bow. You can practice everything. But it's so different than real life game reps like that you have to have those reps and i think once you get as many of those reps the more reps you get in a live action like sequence the better you're gonna get you know yeah i know man i mean i <laughs> i was laughing when you're saying that because the when i was 12 years old my grandpa who's one of the best turkey hunters that I've ever met. He loves chasing long beards and he's still in his seventies. He still chases long beards and kills Love them. it. And he, him and my dad took me out. It took me, I missed three long beards with my shotgun 
before I killed one. And I'm killing a Jake. Then it was my fourth time. And I remember, I remember going out. And I missed like two in the morning. And the next time out, I missed the other one. And I'm like, all right, where's the next one? And my, I remember my dad looking at me and being like, Bo, this isn't, this isn't normal that we've had this many opportunities. He's like, yeah. Like you need to button up and make this happen, and and I, I I remember that distinctly, and and then when it came to archery, I can't tell you it's embarrassing how many deer I missed before I finally killed one. Like it's you you it takes that, and and I'm not. I mean, I say it's embarrassing, but I'm not embarrassed to talk about it because it's that's what you know eventually like build into me getting used to being around deer and do I still get flustered? Yes. Do I still make mistakes? hundred percent. But when you have more of those game time reps, now you're starting to, to be able to do it. And I feel like probably for you as a father, it's like you start, you start remembering like those types of things for yourself. Like when you were back in those shoes and it's just like, man, just got to keep your head up and just keep doing it. Yeah. I mean, I could, this is no kidding. The deer that I've missed with my archery, with my bow, would make most people quit bow hunting. But those reps have compiled to who, the, who I am today. Uh, one, I put more practice reps in. I mean, I actually practice a lot now. But those reps of chasing those deer on the ground in the timber and missing i mean it's paid off but like it's not embarrassing to me because i mean i could tell stories on deer that i've been on that just movie grandes man i mean giants that i've fouled up on and i'm talking about less than 20 yards have a range finder in, in, on my side and and thinking oh that deer's 30 and shoot and miss, you know, fly it right over its back and not even know I'm in the world. I mean, it's happened so many times. And it's simple as grabbing my rangefinder because, you know, you got time. But I've done so many screw ups like that. And I laugh about it now because all those mistakes, they've paid off for me now. I'm pretty consistent with with success. And, and hunting mature whitetails, uh, I struggle when I go out of state um, to – there's such a big difference between terrain. Yeah. <laughs> and it messes with me sometimes. I, we talked about it like hunting in Indiana, Missouri. It's really messed with me. I, it's, it's like I couldn't find deer because I was looking for the same stuff I'm looking for here in the mountains. and. It's not that way, I have found. Um, but all my failures in the years past, because, I mean, I'm telling you, I've shot at some <laughs> monsters and missed them. But it doesn't bother me because all those reps have paid off, and it will for anybody. I just wish I practiced as much as I do now when I – you know, 25 years ago when I first got out of service, because, I mean, we were on deer all the time, and I just would foul up one after another, you know. Yeah, and and uh, I'll always remember, um, it really, I mean, I guess it's really not that long ago in the grand scheme of things, but, like, college and then even a little bit after that, um, so 10, 10 years ago or so, I, everyone in my family and everyone knew me was like, you have the most opportunities at big bucks that I, that I've ever seen, and I was just freaking airballing it. You yeah, know? like it was it was at a point where I wanted to quit bow hunting because I was doing so poorly at the execution standpoint. I remember I had in 2012, I had 150. I bet it was 150 to 155 inch deer, and at that point, it's still it's a freaking giant deer anywhere. But in Pennsylvania, that was like you're 170 like it just it didn't really exist much and i had him at like to actually define the funny story about that is he was standing in the same spot at the same exact tree where i killed my deer this year 
Okay. Ten, ten years later. Okay. And same spot, everything, but facing different direction. And I shot. I blacked out so bad that I got. I had no phone service. So I got out of the tree, went back up to the, my Jeep at the time, and and I called my family. I said, "Bring everybody in." I just smoked. A, <laughs> I just smoked this deer. He's got split G twos on both sides. He's just. He's an absolute hammer. And uh, that was also the last spot. The the, the last time that that uh, my dad helped me out with anything um, as far as. Um, he had hung a tree stand there at that time and I'm, I was not allowed to hunting any of his tree stands ever again. Um, and then eventually we adopted some of the similar areas and started overlapping, but he had, uh, but anyways, I called everybody in. My grandpa came in, my dad, my uncle, my brother, and they're like, well, there's, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing here. There's some hair. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's got to be wrong. That's got to be wrong. Well, they weren't. No, it was. It was fact. And and I remember my grandpa saying to me, he goes, ah, "Don't worry about it. Keep your head up." He's like, he's like, "Ah, you you, you only missed two deer this year, whatever it was." <laughs> uh, he goes, "It." Th-, I go, "I want to throw my bow." He goes, "At three, you kill your bow," and or uh, maybe went. He said, "You only missed two. and I said, "Grandpa, that was number three. And he goes, "Chuck it." <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that, but it's just like those opportunities, like of things. I've just I can think of you know as you can like so many of them, and it's just like. But I feel like now it's just like all of a sudden all those things and all those failures and me just freaking being so mad at just myself now. And now and I'm not again going not saying I don't mess up. I do mess up. Everyone's oh. I put it on public platforms now, so people know when I mess up. But it's like. I feel so much more confident in those things and it's led to things working out for me for I, and I truly believe a lot of that's from that failure and me getting mad to the point where I'm like, I need to practice more. I need to do this to get to, to not have that happen. And I don't know. It's, it's, it's fun to see the journey. And I, and you know, when you're on your deathbed and I'm on mine, we'll be looking back and we were still on that journey. Like we never got, you know, you never get to that, that perfect level. It's just, it's a whole lifetime of just trying. That's it. And that's the, I mean, that's why we deer hunt, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't deer hunt for any other reason just to keep trying and then find it. Yeah. You know, the, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's such a joy to be out there. I mean, whether you, I think it was Clay Newcomb that I was texting with. And he was like, you, you killing anything? We were checking in on the phone. I was like, no. I was like, but I'm still having fun. I'm learning stuff. You know, good experience every time. He's like, it's a great attitude to have. You know? <laughs> yeah. And that's what it is, is. You try to learn something every time you're in the woods. I mean, learn today. And all those pieces come together to hopefully – that you do find success out of all the failures, all the knowledge, whatever, the good and the bad. Um, so yeah. that, that's the only way I look at deer hunting. I mean, it, I probably had the best season. Well, I, Talk about Kentucky, and I know I, I – Well, I think that I, the, this was the, the only year – two in 22 – this past fall was the only year like I've killed two – mature bucks because you're only allowed to kill one mature buck here in the southern four and then you're out and i've killed bucks over at the house that are good deer uh but it's a rifle county and you know the deer just don't have time to grow up you know there's good deer there but they just don't have the ages and then um the other deer i killed was in kentucky i'd Went down the first week of season in Kentucky. I've always turkey hunted over there. Never deer hunted. Always wanted to hunt hunt deer. And went down the first week of season. Got on some deer. Had an opportunity one night. And I think it deer pegged us. You know, he he saw, he just saw something he didn't like. He was a real nice nine point And 
you know, I even said in the video, I said, I, I'll shoot you, you know, if I get the opportunity. But he never gave us the opportunity. He kind of just bugged out there. We were in deer, but it was 95 to 100 degrees. Tough week. We hunted every, you know, we didn't hunt the mornings. We hunted every afternoon. Was in deer. Uh, and then I normally hunt in Ohio, Halloween, and those first few days after Halloween. Um, but Ohio, where I was hunting, has really got overran with, with, with hunters. Um, so I, I decided to go to Kentucky that week too. So, uh, Zach and I went back that week. We said we're going to hunt the next eight or nine days. And we did. You know, I was dealing with bed bugs that week, and it was just, it was very hard for me to hunt when I had thousands of bites all over me. You know, it was just a mission. Did you rent an Airbnb or was it a hotel? Well, we, we were at Airbnb, and, you know, it's hard to explain, but like I've slept in some bad places in the Marine Corps, a lot of insects, a lot of stuff. And it, like, I told Zach that next the second morning the first morning we were because we got out there late i was only in bed for like two hours before we got up and went hunted so i only had a couple bites and i was like oh it might have been something out here whatever but then like the second night we got in bed early and i woke up like at four but like throughout the night i felt stuff crawling on me and i just kind of brushed it off i was like oh, it's probably beetles or something that got in here you know like so i just brushed it off and went back to sleep I'd wake up again, just brush, you know, felt stuff crawling on me. And it wasn't any big deal. But then when I got up, man, I was like, man, what the hell? You know, I have been eaten alive. And I had thousands of bites. So it was a really hard week for me to concentrate and hunt. Zach ended up killing a, a, a deer the last morning that we were there hunting public. And, like, it was awesome, you know, because uh, we had hunted hard. And he ended up finding some some real good success and i was happy for zach and and then came back to west virginia and hunted rut and and then getting closer to christmas because uh fuzz lives down that way and and he had been running some cameras for us and we just sharing information and got a picture of of a big buck and so it's Christmas. We got a got a picture Christmas Eve. I love this part. So Christmas morning we wake up and you know we're we're early risers at our house every day but like Christmas, you know, Brody he he still loves Christmas and we love watching him and and so we're sitting there and so we wake up early. We're done opening gifts. We eat our coffee cake, drink our hot cocoa coffee whatever we're done and it's like nine thirty. and I, I looked at Stacy and I said hey I said uh I'm thinking about bouncing down to Kentucky and she's like okay yeah it's cool she said when you think about leaving and I was like well I'm thinking about leaving right now I was like we're, we're done opening gifts you know <laughs> everything's cool you know it's over with and uh she said you know what he said, I don't ever say anything to you and about hunting and, and doing your thing. She said, but uh, you bounce to Kentucky, you just keep on bouncing. And I said, well, well you put it that way, you know, I better stick around for dinner. <laughs> you hear me? <laughs> so so I, I stuck around. I stuck around the whole Christmas day and, I, and like I'm smothered. And, uh, didn't get a picture of him Christmas Day, which no big deal. So Monday, I end up going into work, and I was like, "I'm gonna go on in get get all my stuff took care of." Got a picture of him at like three o'clock in the afternoon. I was like, "God, what a gag!" I was like, "Hell, hell with it. I'm going home and I'm leaving." But at the time. You know, our interns, Harry and Alex, we'd pretty much told them to go enjoy their time with their family's Christmas. They didn't have to worry about filming anymore. Harry was all the way up in New York. Alex had gone back to work. 
So I'm scrambling for a cameraman. Zach couldn't couldn't go because he hadn't killed a deer here. He was still on deer, so he was self filming here. Jay was in Ohio trying to fill his tag self filming. Uh, I talked to a buddy of mine, Kenny Davis, at Whitetail Frenzy to see if one of his guys was available. Uh, talked to Jared Schaefer, see, but he was still he had a tag. He was still chasing. Jared called um, one of their cameramen there at Tethered. He was in New York with his family. It just didn't work out. I called Hagen, our intern from two years ago. He, he lives in Kentucky. Uh, he couldn't go, and I was like, you know, I'm going. I'm and I've I've self filmed before, but like I've not self filmed. My self filming in the past has been, been like one frame and just hit record and whatever happens in that frame, you know, that's like, what like, you yeah, get. like my self filming. <laughs> yeah. So I really committed to it and I said, you know what, I'm gonna go down here and I said, I'm I'm gonna film how you're supposed to, so we can make a video. Whatever happens. And so got down there and perfect weather it was it was at the tail end of that big cold front that was before Christmas, so it was still in the twenties. There was snow on the ground. And got in this area. The wind was, was going to be perfect. You know, it, it was a, a south wind. And got in this area, and it was it's old mine reclamation. So it's kind of like I'm right back at home, just with all, without all the elevation. There's still elevation differences, but it's really easy yeah. elevation. Uh, so... Get in there first evening, and I've got some. I had some does come through that were browsing, and a, a really nice eight point. And like, I'm sitting there contemplating shooting this deer. Yeah, you. I sent you a you, picture. You did, yeah. And I said, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, am I fouling up when I know that this bigger deer's in the area? But I know I'm down there for the whole week. Like I've already told myself, like I'm staying. I'm going hunt. Whether it's, the only thing I knew, I probably needed to be back New Year's Eve. Um, but that whole night, like I'm talking about how, well, I'm not talking. I'm talking to myself. You know, when you're by yourself hunting, you do a lot of that. And so I get back to the hotel and I'm like, man, I fouled up. You know, I should have went ahead and shot at that deer. I, I, you know, I don't know if I'd have killed him or not or whatever, but I should have went ahead and took the opportunity. And I'm looking at the weather, and the weather is getting warmer, and the wind's getting higher. So the next day, oh, no, I wake up. And I was wore out, so I slept in. I didn't get up. I mean, I got up early and was getting ready to get ready. And I was like, man, I'm not in no rush. I'm going to lay down. And I'm going to get up here in a couple of hours because I'm tired. Because, I, you know, six-hour drive, I hunted in that cold. And the cold zapped me that day before. So I start heading there. It's daylight. It's 7, 7.30. And... I'm heading down there to hunt again, and I'm in the same set. I'm in the same tree. I picked out a decent tree, good cover, good place for camera arm, everything. The wind's blowing 25, Whew. and, you know, it's just whipping me around the tree all day. It's like 3.30. I haven't seen a deer. And, like, I'm, I'm messaging with Fuzz, and I'm like, dude, this wind is for the birds. You know, I would have never sat here this long. I'd been in the stand since 745, something like that. I was like, if I was back home, because the deer here in the mountains, when the wind's blowing, they typically lay down. You know, they're not up and moving. And he was like, dude, they're used to the wind down here. He said, just hunt. So I got it in my head that, I really don't have nothing to go to. I'm going to go back to a hotel room. I might as well just sit here till dark. And 
lo and behold, I had just got done doing an interview, self-filming. I had the camera, the big camera, pointing at me. And I don't know, the sun, I really can't remember whether the sun hit him and I saw his horns, but I looked like 45 yards from me in this thicket. And I was like, holy bejeez. Oh. So, it, you know, I'm trying to get the camera turned around. And that was first and foremost. Like, I never grabbed my bow, nothing. Like, I wanted to get the camera on him. And it took that deer, like, that deer was so spooked. The wind the wind was blowing good wind, but I think it was swirling. And, dude, there was probably two or three times that I thought that that deer was bugging out on me. Like, he completely jumped and, like, bound twice and then would stop. And I was like, what's he doing? I mean, and he was continuously throwing his nose up in the air. And you can see it in the video. You know, it took him 45 minutes to come 25 yards. Uh, and, and then he, you know, he came into a shooting lane and then ended up thumping him too, clapped his lungs. Uh, but like that deer was so on edge the whole way in and there's no chance of him smelling me. Cause I mean, the wind's blowing yeah. 25 mile an hour in my face and the deer is at my one o'clock and ended up killing that deer and it, probably my biggest deer. Uh, score wise to date, um, and oh, just a great a, self film. He's a freaking giant. Yeah, uh, and this is the best part for me. Yeah, first of all, you did an excellent job self filming, <clears throat> way better than than I that I tried my best this year. But uh, excellent job. The video turned out great. Like I'm very not that I'm saying I'm surprised. I'm just saying that I it was oh, very. Pleasant. I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but no i i you facetime me while you're at the deer because he didn't That's go right. very far i did you did you facetime me and you talk to me like you know the whole way out and you're going to get your stuff at your truck and come back in and 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 oh my gosh dude the the excitement and i don't remember where i was at i wish i i think i was in my office i was working i was sitting there late and i was like it's not dark yet, and Josh is calling me. There's, again, we go down on these two things, but I knew you were going down there for that deer, and I'm like, it's before dark. He killed this deer, and I remember answering and just being, and you were just like, you couldn't even make words happen because you were just so pumped up. Oh, um, yeah. I was. I mean, I was down there. You know, I try to call Brody. You, Zach. Jay. Jay couldn't answer because he was in Ohio. Zach was in a tree. He texted me back and said, got deer all around me. I said, okay, don't worry about it. Watch your watch your deer. You know, I got one on the ground, baby. <laughs> 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 you know, Brody was at freaking basketball practice because I forgot about the time zone. And I called Bo and, and like, Bo was like, hey, hey, what's up? And I was like, dude. <laughs> and like, I'm high try. I, I I was high high fiving trees, dude. I don't even know what I'm doing. Don't even know what I'm saying. I'm so excited, you know. And it was it was a great hunt. And uh, he was a slammer of a deer. Um, and it was you know learned a lot from that hunt. Um, and hunting kind of those lower lying hills. But it was a, it was a blast and. Uh, got him home, and it was worth the trip for sure. Yeah. You know, but, I mean, I was. And when I called you, I was, like, I, I remember calling you, but, like, you know how when you're so stoked up. Your adrenaline just yeah. ripping. Yeah. And then you calm down, and, like, I always think, man, I just, Bo probably thinks I acted a fool. <laughs> No. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get the same way, and and uh, yeah, I I just remember I I remember that so distinctly, and I'm just like, this is 
just just awesome and 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 see like i i remember being in my office just like i i kept like like walking around like just back and forth like with with like a violent tendency for no reason you know just like kind of like pumped up like kind of flexing a little bit like just like yeah because i felt like i was there and getting like i love that like there's there's not there's not a ton of people that call me for those reasons um but my close group of friends my close circle and family like when they call and this when that happens um i feel like that i just shot that deer like i was i had adrenaline spike like i was going through it and it was you that was was there i was just like because also i knew how hard you had worked and like how hard you've been working this year with with filming and and doing all this stuff and making it work and like with that all came together at that point like closing out the year right before the new year oh yeah it was just it was phenomenal i love getting those calls yeah. I mean, two years ago when you were coming down, that's when your dad killed that booner. Yeah. And you called me. He's like, I'm going to be late. And I was like, what happened? You went, dad shot that monster. I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. I was like, it's great to be late. Yeah. You know, and I even talked to your dad. Yeah, 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 you did. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that. I mean, those phone calls are so fun. They're priceless, man. Yeah. They are. Uh, they are they're they're absolutely priceless and i i yeah i love those phone calls and and getting them and 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 i like being on the receiving end just as much as i do when i when i call out oh it, yeah that was kind of that was kind of bittersweet this year with me and my pennsylvania buck i didn't have service i had my in reach so i texted my dad mason and kurt cause my brother was home uh during that time and i was like hey i just hit a really good buck and they're like what's the story like we've heard this before yeah. <laughs> i'm like i'm not saying a guarantee but i'm pretty sure i heard him crash and you know he only died 30 yards away but it was in some thick stuff and i you know i i go through my head i try to like balance myself out like even though i think like something happened i'm like nope just play it as nothing happened go get the guys i remember when i got out of the tree and i'm walking to go back to the truck i'm like you just peek over here you know and then i saw the belly and he was and i you know yeah he was pumped but like i i love being able to be in the tree and and get or like you walk up to it and being able to like just share the experience with people that can't be there and that's it like i talked about it in the video like I enjoyed that hunt, but I was there by myself. And it's not the same as when you're hunting with somebody or can share the experience with somebody. Like, I hunt so that, you know, if you and I were hunting, so we could build stories together, memories. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed it, but it's not the same – like, I love the celebration, whether you kill, I kill, somebody else kills. Like, I love that when people are with you to share that experience. And that's the that was the only, it's not really a downfall, but that's the only thing that a lot of people like hunting by themselves. I don't. It's a, it's a social thing for me. I love sharing the hunt, whether it's a spot and stalk, whatever. I just like hunting with people. I like being able to talk and BS, tell stories while we're hunting. Even if it is a cameraman in the tree with you, you're still sharing that hunt together. That hunt together. You're, you're sharing it with somebody. And then you share it with everybody through, through film. But it's not the same for me inside, you know, for my not feelings but but yeah so well, it, i mean like for for me the the difference is like a lot of t i mean most of the time i'm hunting deer by myself but what i have is the deer camp atmosphere we go back to camp yeah. and i have that and that's what like brings it all together for me when i was down here last year and you know you weren't around and stuff and i'm sit sleeping in a tent by myself like i do enjoy being by myself and having that but it was it was a little bit of a, a downer compared to the year prior when we got to yeah. have all those experiences yeah. together and like motivate each other just to keep going that's what it's about yeah yeah i i totally 
I, I totally can. We're not let that happen this fall. No. Be a full on. I'm I'm basically going to be a West Virginia resident. There you go. This coming year. I like the sounds of that. I mean, I've been I've been on Zillow. I've been looking. <laughs> I've been looking. Good luck. <laughs> I'm 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 looking. So you don't. Yeah. Next thing you know, I'll be like, hey, next call. Hey, Josh. What, Bo? I'm moving to West Virginia. I was like, hell yeah. Let's go, baby. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> that's not a good idea. We turn out some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we would. <laughs> but anyway, Josh, I apologize. I kept you longer than I said I would. But thank you so much. I mean, I I thoroughly enjoyed Dude, this podcast. Dude, I always love jumping on with you, telling stories, talking about our experiences, everything, man. I I do. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. And our friendship that we've developed, uh, we've got a lot of similarities. Yeah. And uh, enjoy enjoy our time when we're talking in the woods, whatever, man. Because Bo and I keep in contact even when we're not podcasting or hunting. I mean, All we're time. always texting and calling each other and throwing ideas back and forth. And I appreciate that. Yeah. And it, we've, it's went from even hunting to life to solving the world's problems. Yeah. We, we got, we got it all that comes in there. And I, and I do appreciate that. And I think it's really cool. Like through hunting, the people that I've met have, is just like, it. I feel very blessed on that front of just like having such great people around. And I think that's, that's a cool aspect of it for sure. Yeah, man. We'll jump back on and do another one. If you get back down, uh, Hopefully, Bo comes down spring gobbler hunt. Yeah, we get, yeah, we got it. We there's a lot of things that we still haven't talked about. Like we've talked about deer a lot, but you love turkey hunting and you're a good turkey hunter, bear hunting. Like there's there's plenty that we have yet to cover, so we can do some more podcasts and bring everyone else involved to hopefully feel like they're here with us and yep, uh, be able to do that. But with that being said, check out the Untamed on YouTube. Subscribe to their channel. I promise you won't be disappointed. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, all of those places. And then Josh's personal Instagram. I think it's just Josh Eldridge. Yep. So check that out. Is there anything else? Or did, no, I, man. did I do all the marketing for you? Yeah, I appreciate that. I got you. I appreciate that. I got you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.